we are picking up page 37 in the handout, which is uh, about line 1029. I'm actually going to go back to the beginning of Antigone's little speech before she's led out. Land of Thebes, city of all my fathers, O oh, you gods, the first gods of the race. And you got a footnote. Um, they're talking about their ancestry, their being descended from Cadmus, etc. They dragged me away, now no more delay. They, meaning the guards, in through the guards, Crayon, look on me, you noble sons of Thebes, the last of a great line of kings. Okay? Because Oedipus, Oedipus, however you want to pronounce his name, is descended from Laius, who ultimately is descended from Cadmus and a god. Okay, that's mentioned there in that footnote. So she's saying, I'm the last of our race. I alone see what I suffer now at the hands of what breed of men. And what she's kind of doing there is she's, uh, I'm not contradicting, what's the other word I want? Juxtaposing her family line, her ancestry, her genealogy with crayons. Because crayon isn't descended from that line. Remember, Crayon is Yocasta's wife. Yocasta is married to Laius, but she's not necessarily a descendant of Cadmus and such. At the hands of what breed of men, all for reverence, my reverence for the gods. Okay? So again, she's implying it's this kind of binary. She's dying because <clears throat> she's standing up for the gods and the state won't allow her to do what the gods demand. Yet, up to this point, <clears throat> how has she frequently muddied, let's say, that so-called pure devotion? What does she mix it with? What else does she emphasize? Glory. So is it that? Is it that? Or is it a combination of the both? Or of the two? Okay? And then we get a long speech by the chorus. And you got a long footnote explaining the speech and what the editors have done because they've had to supply some information. Okay, where the chorus compares her to various figures in Greek mythology, women who have suffered a similar fate, who have been walled up inside a cave, etc. Okay, and their speech ends, page 39, uh, 1087 or so. But even on her, who's the on her? I'm trying to see who the her is. Go back. Can't find it. It's either Danae or Cleopatra. Um, Danae, I guess. But even on her, the fates, the great everlasting fates, wrote hard, my child, my child, my child. Okay. Notice the chorus is taking the gods out. Because the fates aren't the gods. The fate is different. And there are three fates, by the way. Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropo. I think this is the right order. Um, weaver or spinner, measurer, and cutter. And what that means is Clotho spins out the yarn, if you want, of your life. Okay? So your life is like a piece of thread. Lachesis is one who measures where your life ends. 
And atropo, the word from which we get atrophy, like when a muscle atrophies, it rots and wears away. Atropo is the cutter, the one who cuts the thread of your life. There's three Germanic fates, also called the Norns. This is an Indo-European notion. It goes back thousands of years. Before there were separate Greeks, separate German, Germanic peoples, separate Italic peoples, etc. Okay? Tiresias comes in, led by a boy. Has Tiresias been called for? From what we know. Has anyone sent for Tiresias? Nope. He comes in on his own. And what that often means, there's, I think it, that happens in a couple other Greek plays that I've not read for probably literally 30 plus years, um, is that he has a burden. He, he, something is impelling him to do that. If, if you look at Old Testament prophets as an example, they're kind of similar. It, it, it kind of falls in the job of prophecy. Whenever the Old Testament prophet says, thus saith the Lord, that's because they can't stop it. They are burdened with that, and until they get it out, they're ill at ease, okay? So he comes in. Lords of Thebes, I and the boy have come together hand in hand to see with the eyes of one so the blind must go, meaning the boy has to lead him with a guide to lead the way. Crayon, what is it? Old Tiresias, what news now? I will teach you, and you obey the seer. Now remember earlier, Haman said something about not being too old to learn? And he says, if one can learn, then one can do what? What comes with learning? Change. Change. Learning changes a person, right? Or one can learn to change from what one learns. Crayon, I will. I've never wavered from your advice before. Remember, it was Crayon who Oedipus sent to get Tiresias before. In Oedipus the king. And it was Crayon who kind of defended a little bit Tiresias. Partially because he and Tiresias were being um, charged with plotting against Oedipus. So he says, of course. I've never wavered from your advice before, and so you kept the city straight on course. Tiresias is telling us from the end of the play Oedipus, kind of to now, even when the intervening time when Eteocles was, you know, king, people took his advice. He, he showed how to rule, okay? I owe you a great deal. Then reflect, my son. What does calling Crayon my son imply or do? He's not talking literal son. Master, pupil, okay? He's kind of showing this power imbalance. Yes, Crayon's king. But Tiresias is the one with all the knowledge, all the wisdom. Then reflect, my son, you are poised once more on the razor edge of fate. Meaning, one step and you crash and burn. But what is it? You will learn when you will listen to the warnings of my craft. Okay? And he talks about, your footnote tells you, the different ways that a prophet divines the future, okay? Sees the birds, etc., etc. He does the bird sacrifice, and then he says, skipping to 1131, take these things to heart. At, let me go back. That first stanza, 1104, beginning 1104, 1103, he talks about seeing the bird, the talons, etc., etc., so he says, I was afraid. I turned quickly. So that was one sign. Okay? So he does another means of what's called augury. Okay? To determine the future. 
The next one is a burnt sacrifice. And he says, 11.14, Not from those offerings over the embers slid a heavy ooze from the long thigh bones, smoking, sputtering out, the bladder puffed and burst, spraying gall into the air, etc., etc. The rites failed that might have blazed the future with the sign. In other words, this is not a good or auspicious sign. So I learned from the boy here, he is my guide as I am guide to others. That is, the boy told him what the burnt offering did. It didn't properly burn. If it didn't properly, properly burn, then what do the gods think of that burnt offering? Nothing. Okay? If the gods aren't pleased, we won't be pleased. And it is you, 1122 or so, your high resolve that sets this plague on Thebes. So notice, we kind of go right back to where we were at the beginning of Oedipus. The king has caused a plague. The public altars, sacred hearths are foul. One and all, by the birds and dogs were carrying, torn from the corpse. You're not letting Polynices be buried means the birds and the dogs are eating from that, and their eating from that corpse is what is stopping all the offerings from being effective. What is Crayon really saying? Beginning to this. Who's right? Antigone. Antigone's following the old, unshakable, unwritten traditions. And so the gods are deaf to our prayers. They spurn the offerings in our hands, the flame of holy flesh. They're gorged with the murdered gift victim's blood and fat. Take these things to heart, my son, I warn you. In other words, he's not saying, just think about these. He's saying, let this get deep within you. Okay? Why? What does Crayon need? Does he need a change of attitude? No, he needs a change of heart. All men make mistakes. It is only human. But once the wrong is done, a man can turn his back on folly misfortune too. And he seems to be implying, or he is saying, let me rephrase that, he doesn't seem to imply. He says, we can do what? We can change our fortune. Okay? We can change, in that sense, our fate. How? If he tries to make amends however low he's fallen, and stops his bull-necked ways. What's meant by bull-necked? What's one of the things Oedipus was accused of? Stubbornness. If you've ever seen a bull, a bull is hard to get to change direction. Okay, It's, it's not easy to just go, you know, go left or go right. Stubbornness brands you for stupidity. Suddenly, he's just told Crayon what? You're stupid. Pride is a crime. How is it a crime? He doesn't mean a legal crime. Like, you know, U.S. Penal Code, whatever. It's a crime what? Against the God. Because pride can lift one or can make one think, I'm like a god. No, yield to the dead. Give way. Never stab the fighter when he's down. Where's the glory killing the dead twice over? Really? How hard is it to, to kick a corpse? It's a lot harder, to, a lot easier to kick a corpse than it is to kick the person that became the corpse 
when they're standing up facing you and ready to fight. That's his point. I mean you well. I intend good for you, Crayon. I give you sound advice. It's best to learn from a good advisor. When he speaks for your own good, it's pure gain. Okay, so what has Tiresias just done? What has he given Crayon? That we've seen, you know, Crayon gives Antigone two of these when she first comes in, having been caught trying to bury Polynices. And then she kind of, or Haman kind of gives to him when he tries to school his father. A great big way out. Okay? And it is a way out that allows Crayon to retain what? His dignity. Because if he relents now, what is his justification for saying Polynices will be buried? Huh? Just following the gods. Old man. Notice, Tiresias called him son. Old man. All of you. Not just Tiresias, of chorus too. What's he mean by old man? Is he just stating a fact? I mean, Tiresias is an old man. In every instance that I can think of in Greek literature, he's always old. We never see Tiresias as a young man, okay? Like doddering fool, senile person. You shoot your arrows at my head like archers at the target. I even have him loosed on me. This fortune teller. He doesn't mean fortune teller like prophet. He means fortune teller like you can go, I don't even know if there is one in Murfreesboro, but I know there are in Nashville, where you can go and pay money and somebody will look in a crystal ball to tell you your fortune. Meaning... Liar. Someone who tells you kind of what you want to hear for money. Why does he blame the chorus? He's suggesting the chorus sent for him. Sent for Tiresias. He's suggesting the chorus is in on this. Oh, his ilk. Ilk almost always has a slightly negative connotation. If you say, you know, so-and-so and his ilk, ilk there means people like him or people like her. But you know, when you make that kind of statement, so-and-so and his or her ilk, it means people that are different to me, different to what I think, and in doing that, you're kind of being pejorative about them. You're putting them down. His ilk has tried to sell me short and ship me off for years. Will drive your bargains, traffic, much as you like, in the gold of India, names these things. You'll never bury that body in the grave. Polynices is going to rot till he's nothing, is what he's saying. Not even if Zeus's eagles rip the corpse and wing the rotten pickings off to the throne of God. What has he just done? Not even if Zeus sends his personal messengers. Zeus can take this body himself. And I'm not going to bury it. He's just placed himself above Zeus. Okay? Greek tradition, at the time when they still believed in the gods, big no-no. Yeah, you, he just set yourself up for the biggest, hardest fall that you can imagine. Never, not even in the fear of such defilement, will I tolerate his burial, that traitor. Well, I know we can't defile the gods. That is, I can't, metaphorically, 
pick up a handful of mud and throw it at Zeus and hit Zeus. There's nothing humans can do to belittle or lessen or be smirched, he's saying to God. No, Reverend Old Tiresias, and he means that probably sarcastically. Reverend just means worthy of reverence. Doesn't mean, you know, like preacher. All men fall. It's only human. You're right about that. But the wisest fall obscenely. The wisest, Tiresias is supposed to be wise, when they glorify obscene advice with rhetoric. Fancy words, fancy arrangement of arguments, a logical persuasion, okay, all for their own gain. He's saying that Tiresias has come because he's going to get something out of this. <coughs> oh, God, is there a man alive who knows, who actually believes? He doesn't get a finish because Crayon interrupts him. What now? What? earth-shattering truth are you about to utter. Get to the point, old man, who actually believes just how much a sense of judgment, wisdom, is the greatest gift we have. Is there anyone who believes this? Tiresias is asking. Crayon. There are just as much men, just as many men, I'd say, who believe that a twisted mind is the worst affliction known. Tiresias is saying, Crayon, you used to be what? Or you used to have a sense of judgment and wisdom, which is the greatest gift a human can have. Crayon is saying, your mind is twisted. You are the one who's sick sick to death. I'm not going to trade insult with the seer. You already have calling my prophecies a lie. Why not? You and all the brood of seers are in it for the money. And the whole race of tyrants lusts for filthy gain. That is, and what do tyrants want? Despots Included here, it's kings. Every monarch wants money. Are you aware you're speaking to the king? Yep. Who helped you save the city? In other words, you wouldn't have that kingship if it weren't for me. Okay? They go back and forth, and notice, just like in Oedipus, Tiresias has more truth hidden inside. And he's saying, don't push me. Don't push me. I don't want to say it. You will drive me to utter the dreadful secret in my heart. Spit it out. Just don't speak it for profit. Speak it openly. Speak it plainly. Just don't take money for it. He says, okay, here it comes. 1181. Know this too, learn this by heart. The charity of the sun will not race through so many circuits more before you have surrendered one born of your love, one born of your own loins, your own flesh and blood. A corpse for corpse is given in return since you have thrust to the world below, a child sprung for the world above. Meaning, the sun won't set before someone born of you, okay, your offspring will die. Ruthlessly lodged living soul within the grave. What's that referring to? Antigone, how's she in a grave? She's been taken to be walled up in a cave. A cave, because of the very definition of it, is what? Even if this door led into a cave, that means there's earth and everything all around it, right? It's underground, folks. 
It's underground. If it's underground and a body's put in it, it's a grave. Okay? So, ruthlessly lodge the living soul within the grave. Then you've robbed the gods below the earth, keeping a dead body here in the bright air, unburied, unsung, unhallowed by the rites. You have no business with the dead, nor do the gods above. This is violence you have forced upon the heavens. Who does have a business with the dead? The gods below. Hades. Hades is a god. Brother of Zeus. Brother of Poseidon. Okay? It's one of the three. And so the Avengers, the Avengers, those are those figures I've mentioned before. The Furies, who are also goddesses of the dead, of, of below. It's their job to hunt out, seek out, and punish those who don't follow their great, unshakable, unwritten laws. So the Avengers, the dark destroyers, late but true to the mark, now lie in wait for you. Late but true to the mark? That means they may not get you today. They may not get you tomorrow. But they will get you eventually. They never fail in Greek mythology. But true to the mark, now lie in wait for you, the fury sent by the gods and the god of death to strike you down with the pains that you perfected. There. You wanted me to speak at all? Reflect on that. Tell me I've been bribed. The day comes soon, the long test of time, not now, when the morning cries for men and women break throughout your halls. Notice, not the morning cries of men and women. These will be... These will be people mourning for dead men and women, or a dead man and a dead woman. Who do we assume that he's referring to? Who's the dead woman? Antigone, right? Dead man? Who said you will never see me again? Haman, his son. But there's going to be another dead woman. Great hatred rises against you cities and tumult, all those mutilated sons and dogs of grace for burial or the wild beasts, etc., etc. These arrows for your heart, since you've raked me, raked, scratched me like the tines of a rake, I loose them like an archer in my anger. Arrows deadly true. You'll never escape. And he says to the boy, come boy, take me home. That is, I'm done here. So he can vent his rage on younger men. Chorus. And learn to keep a gentler tongue in his head. In better sense than what he carries now. Okay. Let him sit and learn to keep his mouth shut. And he leaves. <coughs> the leader of the chorus. Whew, terrible prophet. Well, I know, since the hair on his old head went gray, he's never lied to Thebes. Remember? Oedipus accused him of lying. He was right. Crayon, I know it myself. Ooh, there's a change. I'm shaken, torn. It's a dreadful thing to yield. But resist now? What's he mean it's a dreadful thing to yield? For him, Crayon, to have to reverse direction, to rescind his proclamation, to allow Polynices to be buried. But resist now? Resist what? Resist the gods? <laughs> resist the gods? Lay my pride bare to the blows of ruin? That's dreadful too. What does he think could happen if he gives in, if he yields? Well, you yield once. You're going to have to 
deal twice because people are going to expect him to get, I mean, look at Bailey. Kids start banging on the back of the seat, yelling, screaming, and okay, we're going to stop just this once, you know. It, the implication is it's happened more than once. Not the side road, but giving in. Crayon, take it now. That is, it's good advice. Take it now. You must. What should I do? Tell me. I'll obey. Why is he asking the chorus? Tyrese has already told him what to do. Go. Free the girl from the Rocky Vault. Notice what the leader of the chorus says here. Look at the order in which it is said. Go. Free the girl from the Rocky Vault and raise a mount for the body you exposed. Why in that order? How long will Polynice's body remain dead? It's a stupid question, right? He's dead. He's not changing. How long does Antigone have to live sealed up in the cave? We don't know how much food and water she has. We don't know how much air is in the cave. If they go and bury the body first and then go and cover, let Antigone out, she may already be dead. In which case, he's got two corpses now. That's your advice? You think I should give in? Yes, <laughs> quickly. Disaster sent by the gods cut short our follies in a flash. What's a folly? It's related to the word fool and foolish. Our foolish actions. Oh, it's hard. Giving up the heart's, what is the heart's desire that he has to give up? What's one of the hardest things to say to another person? Two words. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. Could both of those mean? I was wrong. The heart's desire is, I want to be right all the time. But I will do it. No more fighting a losing battle with necessity. Another word for necessity is fate. If something is a necessity, it cannot be outdone. It cannot be gone around. It cannot be ignored or avoided. Do it now. Don't leave it to others. Why does the leader say don't leave it to others? You do this, Crayon. What happened when Lias and Yocasta left killing the little baby? To others. Oedipus' fate. I'm on my way. Come, each of you. Take up axes. Make for the high ground over there quickly. That is, go to the cave. I, in my better judgment, have come round to this. I shackled her. I'll set her free myself. Now, that's, that's good. He's learning. I'm afraid it's best to keep the established laws to the very day we die. That is, not those laws. The great, unshakable, unwritten traditions. The higher moral law, so to speak. Okay? So the chorus gets a speech. Talks about a variety of gods, a bunch of stuff that happens to people because of the gods, etc., etc. And the messenger comes in. Neighbors, friends of the house of Cadmus and the kings, there's not a thing in this mortal life of ours I praise or blame as settled once in for all, or once for all. In other words, nothing in this world is permanent. Everything changes. Fortune lifts and fortune fells, the lucky and unlucky every day. Fortune is described in Greek literature and later medieval literature as a wheel. There's a game show on TV. It's been on forever. Wheel of Fortune, right? And Fortuna is often portrayed as a goddess. 
And she stands there and she spins the wheel of fortune for each of our lives. Where do you want to be on this wheel? It spins in this direction. Probably on this side. Why? Because when you're here, this is when reversal occurs in tragic plagues. <clears throat> you crash and burn. All right? But notice, the wheel turns. It never stops. Those who are on this trajectory will get to this point, and it doesn't stop. You don't hop off fortune's wheel at that point. It keeps turning. Okay. Fortune lifts, fortune fails, the lucky and unlucky every day. No prophet on earth can tell a man his fate. Why? Because of this. Take crayon. There was a man to rouse your envy once, as I see it. He saved the realm from enemies, taking power, he alone. The Lord of the Fatherland, he set us true on course, he flourished, blah, blah, blah. Believe me, when a man has squandered, excuse me, back up. He flourished like a tree with the noble line of sons he bred and reared, and now it's lost, all gone. Thank you for getting rid of all the suspense, right? Suspense wasn't an issue for the ancient Greeks. Suspense wasn't an issue in writing, in literature, until probably... 1700 or so. No writer really thought that much about building up suspense, so to speak. Okay? Believe me, when a man has squandered his true joys, he's good as dead. I tell you, a living corpse, pile up riches in your house as much as you like. Live like a king with a huge show of pomp, but if real delight is missing, I wouldn't give you a wisp of smoke for it. Little ear. What? I mean, this messenger comes in from nowhere. It delivers this little, like, mini-sermon. What new grief do you bring? Dead, dead. And the living are guilty. Who, who's the murderer? Who? Of course, doesn't know what's going on. Haman's gone. His blood spilled by the very... His father's or his own? Like, did his father kill him? His own. Raging mad with his father for the death. Oh, great seer. Tiresias saw it all, you know. Eurydice comes in as the messenger leaves. The leader speaks. Eurydice comes in and says, um, I caught the sound of your words as I was leaving to offer my prayers to Athena. There's a voice filled with sorrow, family sorrow. It struck my ears. Ears. I fell back, terrified. Everything went black. Tell me, um, what happened? The messenger. I was an eyewitness. I saw it. I won't tell you. I won't tell you a lot. Okay. So he says, I escorted your lord. That is crayon. I guided him to the edge of the plain where the body lay. What did Crayon do first? He buried Polynices. What did the leader of the chorus say to do? Go to the cave, then bury the body. Polynices, torn by the dog, still unborn, etc., etc. And we heard a voice that as we buried him, we turned and made for that rocky vault of hers. Far off, one of us heard a voice, a long wail rising, echoing out of that unhallowed wedding chamber. Unhallowed, unholy. Okay. He ran to alert the master. Crayon passed on. He goes in, and we're told, 1336, Oh God, am I the prophet now, going down the darkest road I've ever gone? My son, it's his voice. So Crayon speaking, I hear Haman's voice. Okay, they go in. They go into the deepest, darkest part of the cave. And there we found her, hanged by the neck in a fine linen noose. Just like Mama. Because the linen was a belt she had. 
a sash that she wore. Strangled in her veils, and the boy, his arms flung around her waist, clinging to her, wailing for his bride. Haman's not dead yet when they find him. Okay, Kind of interesting, because clinging doesn't sound like he's got his arms around her and holding her up. Clinging almost sounds like he's got his arms around her and he's collapsed. In which case, he's tightening the noose around her neck. When Crayon saw him, he gave a deep sob. He ran and shouted, Oh, my child, what have you done? What seized you? What insanity? What disaster drove you mad? Come out, my son. I beg you on my knees. Who's the, oh, my child? Does he mean, oh, my child, literally? No. He's talking about Antigone. Why did you do this? Put yourself in Antigone's shoes. You're walled up inside a cave, and you know you only have a little bit of food and a little bit of water. Do you want to take the long, drawn out agony of dying of suffocation and such, or make it short and quick? But the boy gave him a wild burning glance, spat in his face, not a word in reply. He drew his sword. Crayon rushes out, because he doesn't want to be killed by his son, running as Haman lunged and missed, and then doomed and desperate with himself, suddenly leaning his full weight on the blade, he buried it in his body. He puts the hilt down on the ground. The blade's probably like this long, okay? And then just leans into it and falls on the blade and kills himself with his sword. And still in his senses, pouring his arms around her, he embraced the girl. So he dies, impaled on a sword, but hanging on to Antigone. Okay? Crayon shows the world that of all the ills afflicting men, the worst is lack of judgment. Notice, the worst isn't AIDS, covid a disease. What's meant by lack of judgment? It's another word for judgment. Lack of wisdom. Folly. You read it, she turns and runs into the palace. And the leader's like, huh, I wonder what that means. What have we seen other times when people run into the palace quickly? Okay? So, the messenger says, we'll see if she's holding something back. Crayon comes onto the stage, by escorted by attendants, carrying Haman's body. My crime, so senseless, so insane, my stubborn, deadly, he doesn't finish. My stubborn, deadly what? Pride. Look at us, the killer, the killed, father, son, same blood, my plans, my mad fanatic heart, my son cut off so young. Too late, the leader says. Too late, you see what justice means. What's the leader mean by justice? Was it justice that Haman killed himself? Is that what the leader means? This is the justice brought about by the furies down below. It's, it's implied. It's not stated that it's the furies who spur Haman on to kill himself. Okay? But go back to the beginning of that. Too late, too late. What is the leader and via the leader, the entire chorus, and via the chorus, all of Thebes doing at that point to Crayon's massively open wound. Here, let me get a big thing of salt and just you know, pour that all over. They're just rubbing it in. Wasn't supposed to leak. 
I've learned through blood and tears. Then it was then when the God came down and struck me a great weight, shattering, driving me down the wild savage path. The agony, the heartbreaking agonies of our lives. And the messenger says, hold that thought. <laughs> I've got more agony for you. In the house. What now? Crayon asks. What's worse than this? Queen's dead. The mother of this dead boy, mother to the end, poor thing, her wound. No, no. Why me? Harbor of death. Why me? Why are you killing me? Herald of pain, more words, more grief. I died once. You kill me again and again. How? And so they bring Eurydice out. Remember, the spectacle, the deaths, they all occur out of sight. But it's okay to have corpses on the stage, you know, brought out after the people die. She stabbed herself at the altar. Then her eyes went dark after she'd raised a cry for the noble faith of Megarius, the hero killed in the first assault, then for Haman, then for their own dying breath, she called down torments on your head. That is, oh mighty furies, hunt Crayon down. That's what she does. Crayon, I shudder with dread. Why not kill me too? Come on, gods, come kill me. Yes, and the dead, the woman lying there, piles the guilt of all their deaths on you. You're responsible. She drove home. He says, what bloody stroke? How'd she do it? Slice her throat, slit her wrists. Nope. She drove home to the heart with her own hand. Once she learned her son was dead. And the guilt is all mine. I killed you all. I admit it all. Take me away quickly. I don't exist. <laughs> I'm no one. Nothing. Good advice. If there's any good in suffering, quick is his best when troubles block the way. Okay? Crayon kneels in prayer. Let it come. That is, let the suffering, and what he really means, death. What's he want? He wants quick death. He doesn't want to suffer. He doesn't want to draw it out like Oedipus did. It's implied that when Oedipus comes to his recognition and reversal, he's probably around 25, 30 years old. Oedipus doesn't die until he's old, 70s or 80s. He lives a long, drawn-out life, and every day is agony because he remembers what he's done. Okay? He says, let it happen now so I never have to see another sunrise. Leader. That'll come when it comes. That is, death will come in its own time. We must deal with all that lies before us. Meaning, every moment between now and then. You're going to see when we get to Hamlet, I've mentioned this before, Hamlet's going to say the readiness is all. Being ready, prepared for death. The future rests with the ones who tend the future. The fates. Crayon. That prayer, though, I mean, I, I poured my heart into that prayer. I really meant that prayer. Surely they'll be kind of like merciful to me. Leader, no more prayers. For mortal men, there is no escape from the doom we must endure. What is the leader saying about the efficacy of prayers to the gods? Ain't going to do you a lick of good. Take me away, I beg you, out of sight. A rash, indiscriminate fool. Okay, rash, right? He issues this decree, apparently without thinking about the great unshakable tradition. What's he mean by indiscriminate? See, our society has made the word discriminate bad. It's not bad. There's nothing bad about Discrimination. Why? Because what the word literally means is to be able to tell the difference between things. I can discriminate between this desk and this desk. Why? This 
has a fake wood finish, this has a fake granite finish. They're totally different in that appearance. I can discriminate between this concrete block and this whatever the hell it is. Okay? Probably actually sheet rock covered with plastic because I used to make those when I was in college. Uh, you know, we can discriminate between all kinds of things. Different people, different facial shape. Oh, it's not bad. And what are we, where was I? What were we told? Why was that? I lost my place. To discriminate. Oh, a rash, indiscriminate fool. He's saying, I wasn't able to discriminate between this, this, between himself and the city. Because what did he say? The city is the king's. He wasn't able to discriminate between himself and the gods. See, I think the final stroke. Zeus, get your human away down here yourself and take that body. And I'm still not going to bury him. It's, you know, all restraints off at that point. I murdered you, my son, against my will. You two, my wife, wailing wreck of a man. Whom to look to? What does he mean against my will? Did he desire the death of Haman? Did he desire the death of your energy? No. What did he do? What's my definition of tragedy? And I'm not saying that you have to follow it. When someone is forced to make a decision without having all the necessary information. What information did he possibly lack? Did he even consider the great unshakable traditions, the unwritten laws? No, he didn't. Okay? It's Antigone, who has to remind him of that. Whatever I touch goes wrong. Once more, a crushing fate come down upon my head. The messenger leads him out, and as with every Greek tragedy, the chorus gets the last word. Why? Because the chorus gives us, essentially, the moral. Here's the parting shot. I want you to think as you are leaving the, the big amphitheater. And bear in mind, you know, when this play was produced, there were probably 13, 14,000 people sitting on concrete stone steps, okay, out in the open. Wisdom is by far the greatest part of joy. That is, wisdom is an aspect of joy. And reverence towards the gods must be safeguarded. Not just those gods, but those gods. The mighty words of the proud are paid in full with mighty blows of fate. What are the mighty words of the proud? Boasts. I can do it. I don't need assistance. I don't need help, etc. I am the smartest one. Okay. What happens? Fate knocks you down. And at long last, these blows will teach us wisdom. In other words, what do you need? What must one experience in order to gain wisdom? Adversity, hardship, trouble, pain. Overcoming those, enduring those, is what Sophocles is saying produces wisdom. Okay. Athens, the city that watches his plays, is about to experience, between the production of this play and the next play, great um, adversity. They're going to lose to Sparta. Spartans weren't all these philosophical, oh, let's think the great ideas, let's sit around and talk about philosophy and stuff. Spartans were, I mean, why we get the adjective today. If something is Spartan, what does that mean? It's harsh. It's cruel in some sense. It's spare. This is a Spartan room. Why? There's no decoration, right? 
Go to the business building. Go to any other building built on campus in the last 20 years. They don't look like this. Those are Athenian buildings. This is a Spartan building, okay? They're, they, this building is ugly. Those are beautiful. They're designed to supposedly, you know, lift one spirit. Peck all wants to kill your spirit, so to speak, okay? The blows are what teach wisdom. Sophocles is saying. Okay, we'll stop there. I'm going to put a quiz up today um, for Antigone. I'll have it due today's Wednesday. I'll have it due Saturday or Sunday night. Um, read, if you haven't already, hopefully you kind of stayed on the syllabus. Read the material the, for the first day of Shakespeare that's assigned for the first day of Shakespeare. I think it's a little bit about Shakespeare's theater, and I think it's Act One of Midsummer Night's Dream.